Shalom and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker. Is it really possible to position yourself under an open heaven? Overflowing with the Holy Spirit and walking in the supernatural is the destiny of every child of God according to the Word of God. So how do you position yourself to experience an overflow of divine power? Through scripture and personal experience, author Rod Larkins explores the deep recesses of God's Spirit and reveals how being filled with the Spirit can be as natural as prayer, worship, and reading scripture. A Roadmap to Supernatural Encounters, Pastor Rod Larkins' new book, Overflow, offers teachings and testimonies that will help take you to new dimensions in God. Learn how to access heavenly portals, receive supernatural visions and dreams, experience the fire of God that propels you into your kingdom destiny. You can operate in signs and wonders, walk under an open heaven, you can walk in supernatural abundance, spiritual authority, and spiritual gifts today. Rod Larkins is an American author and pastor. He's a graduate from United Christian College and Global University in August of 22. Uh, 2002, he moved to Houston and launched the Houston Dream Center. He has been considered a reputable voice for his studies on spiritual life and spent years exploring the depths and recesses of the Holy Spirit with a commission to teach the body of Christ how to live and walk in the spiritual life. He's traveled all over the world with this message and lives have been changed. Here to talk about his new book, Overflow, Living Saturated in the Presence and Power of the Spirit is Pastor Rod Larkins. Rod, welcome to Revealing the Truth. Shalom. Good morning, everyone. Shalom to you. Boker Tov, good morning. And to our friends in Israel, Arif Tov, good evening to them as uh, they're getting ready to, uh, it's uh, about 6 o'clock, 6.03 there. And uh, we are uh, live prime time in the Middle East talking to our good friends all across those nations that need to hear this gospel message each and every day of their lives as all of us do. You know, Rod, you have um, a lot of accomplishments, a lot of things that you've done in transforming a community through a lot of hard work. And you've traveled and you've transformed communities and other nations. But this, this faith walk, this faith journey wasn't birthed uh, by going to college. Uh, there was something that was implanted in you by someone, something, somehow, some way, early on in life. And so I always like to take people back to the early years, the early influences, and kind of begin the journey with you as to where it started and how your faith really became your own. And once it became your own, how did it take off on its own? Well, I was, you know, I guess to begin with, I was never, um, I didn't come from a godly home. I was never raised in church. Um, I, I remember, I think one of the, probably one of the defining moments in my life is when I was about uh, seven or eight years old. And I had been with some friends and we were at a construction site in the neighborhood where they were building a new home. And, you know, we were just young kids playing around and I climbed up on uh, the side of some scaffolding and I, you know, misstepped and fell about 15 feet and landed on a, on a corner of a cylinder block, cracked my skull open. Um, you know, I ran home crying. Mom and dad took me to the emergency room and, and I had a mild concussion. Uh, plus they had to suture me back up. But because of that injury for the first probably eight, nine months, I would get real bad headaches and uh, to the point of where it would impair my vision. And I remember it got so bad and I would know for like a day that the headache was coming on and um, we just medicated through it and things like that. But I remember, you know, one distinct evening where um, I, you know, I just, I felt the headache coming on and I went to my mom and I said, mom, I, you know, the, my head's starting to hurt again. And I'm, you know, I'm just going to go in bedroom and pray, which shocked her because, you know, again, we weren't, you know, we weren't church going people. We, you know, nothing, nothing like that. So I went into uh, the bedroom and I knelt down and just began to, and here I am seven years old, not really knowing anything about anything, but I did know enough 
in my heart to cry out to Jesus. And um, the moment I did, it's like the room lit up and I really felt him walk up behind me and touched, you know, the top of my head. And the moment that happened, the headache was gone and I never had another issue. And I, I remember even going back to my mom after that and saying, look, I, you know, my, I believe that Jesus touched me. And she just smiled and, you know, as moms do, that's great, son. And, and, and that was it. That was, the, that was the encounter that I think solidified in my heart that I knew he was real. And it was probably 15 years later that, uh, you know, I was working a great job. I was, you know, everything was going good in life. And I just felt deep down that something was wrong. I felt like something, someone was missing, so to speak. And I remember not, never been in church again, never uh, attended church. I remember one night, um, I woke up in the middle of the night feeling like my body was on fire and uh, went back to sleep, just kind of brushed it off. The next night it happened again. And the third night it happened again. The third night was so bad, I just rolled off the floor, off the bed onto the floor. The very first word that I cried out when I hit the floor was Jesus. And moments later, I got up completely born again. And uh, I knew enough in my heart to cry out to God. And I knew that he was the one that was missing. It was from that, that was on a Saturday night. Sunday morning, I, I looked for a church and ended up in a full gospel church, a little, a little church where um, God would set me up perfectly because the pastor was on fire for God. He was a revivalist of heart, uh, hungry for the real authentic gospel. And uh, a few months later, we ended up in revival. And, uh, and that's kind of what triggered the hunger and quest in my heart, even years after, to really go after the authentic outpouring of the Spirit of God. So I, I kind of attribute to those two encounters, plus being surrounded by some men of God who were hungry for the genuine, that kind of planted and seeded in my heart to go after God with everything in me. Your experience in feeling the <clears throat> presence of God uh, as a young child mm -hmm. that stuck with you, uh, yeah. not something you paid a lot of attention to, but, but wound up having to acknowledge it, uh, that uh, a little gnawing, uh, gnawing away, gnawing away, gnawing away till <clears throat> it finally grips you and captures you. Did you feel at that time that this was an anointing, that this was a calling, this was a mantle being placed on you to do something with it? You know, I did because uh, probably in the first, I would say the first two years of serving in the, the little full gospel church that I started attending, um, there were many Saturdays of where I would go to the church at you know, 12 o'clock, one o'clock in the afternoon, and I would pray until Sunday morning service. You know, the doors would be locked. I'd be in there with just me and God. And I I think those those times of doing that, God began to teach me how to steward and how to host the manifest presence of God. Interesting, though, when I became a pastor, uh, probably in the first year of pastoring, uh, God brought me back into another deep school of the Spirit of God um, and taught me a valuable lesson where the presence of God is concerned. And, and I need to share this because this is really important, especially if there's a lot of ministries that are, are tuning in on, the, on this program. I think one of the challenges that pastors have today is that they love to steward their own service. And, you know, pastors, we are by nature, we, we talk, we love to talk, we love to preach, we love to share the gospel. Um, I was in service one morning getting ready to go up to the pulpit. You know, it's, it's kind of like we have our own set uh, guidelines and, and structure where we open up in prayer, we give announcements, we enter in we praise, enter in worship, then there's the offering, and then the you know preacher goes to the pulpit. That's kind of the routine that we're in, so to speak. But I remember uh, the atmosphere that morning was different. There was it was suppressed. It was not oppressed, but it was like being held back, where it wasn't because of any demonic issue or anything like this. Was the hand of God pressing that service? seemed like nothing moved, nothing worked well, nothing happened. And I remember I was at the point of where I was getting ready to step up to the pulpit. And this is what I heard the Spirit of God tell me, son, sit down. I don't need your message today. Well, when you're a preacher and that's what you do, it's very humbling when God says, I don't need your message. 
So I sat there, everybody's looking at me like, what are you doing? Are you, I mean, we're waiting on you. It's your time to go to the pulpit. And I couldn't say nothing. I, all I did was just sit there. A few minutes later, the spirit of God fell in that atmosphere. And without an altar call, without a sermon, without a, um, an invitation, people started getting up and going to the altar. People didn't even make it to the altar. People were getting touched right where they were sitting. An hour later, we, it finally lifted enough where I could get up and, and go and, and address the people. And one thing that God told me, he said, never ask me to follow you to the pulpit again. You follow me. That was a moment where I learned that if we're going to be in the ministry as carriers of the gospel, we need to learn how to carry the presence and the glory of God and how to steward it. Because there's times where, where God will seal your, your tongue where you can't say nothing. And, it's, and he can do more in those moments than we can do in a year of preaching. And so those were, were I believe, schools that, that God put me in to learn how to, to not only host the presence of God, but how to understand the nature of his presence and the ministry of his presence in the church especially. It's a pattern of God. Uh, Absolutely. We're, we're talking about spiritual <clears throat> climate change. You see, this is the, the, the new green deal of God. This is <laughs> yeah. the climate change of God. Mm -hmm. And if we take a look, he says, you enter my gates with thanksgiving, you enter my courts with praise, but you enter into the holy of holies, bowed down low in worship. I humble myself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift me up. And so when we are doing our job, and we have, have come up with this formula, and this formula is praise and worship is one word. And you, three fast songs, one slow song, and that's praise and worship. Right. And it's follow the bouncing ball because everybody has to look at the screen because they don't know the words, right? So they're not really worshiping, it's a sing-along. It's, exactly. it's, it's uh, group karaoke. <laughs> it's so true. Yeah, you're exactly right. And worship is, first of all, <laughs> the priest was to cleanse himself and make atonement for his own sin before he could ever approach God. Right. And that was through self-examination, okay? Who can go up to the mountain of the Lord? The one with clean hands. I've got to examine myself. What have I set my hands to do? And when I lift them up to you, Lord God, oh, they say, well, that's praise. This is how I praise God. I lift my hands. You are presenting your hands for inspection. And for God to examine, what have you set your hands to do? Do you have clean hands? Then come on up. All right. But if you don't, then go cleanse yourself. Yes. Change your clothes. This was Numbers uh, chapter 11. This was was the instruction uh, to, 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 to do this thing, to wash yourself and then change your clothes. And, and, and this is exactly what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to put on a garment of praise and a, a robe of salvation, a robe of righteousness. And, and, and we've lost sight yeah. of this pattern of God. And because we've lost sight of it, we succumbed to the usurping of our authority and dominion over this earth that was taken from us in the Garden of Eden. It was given back to us in Luke 10, 18 and Luke 10, 19 as disciples of Messiah. The dominion mandate was restored, mm -hmm. but it was only through the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus declared, I have given you the authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing whatsoever shall harm you. Power and authority through the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Pastor Rod, I look at the story of creation, Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. And the Spirit of the Lord hovered over the deep, and then God spoke. Right. I see Jesus come up out of the water, and the Spirit of the Lord descends upon him like a dove. And then God spoke. Well, it seems to me that's an order. That's a yep, pattern. Absolutely. Is that the power and the anointing comes speaking through 
the Holy Spirit. The Spirit has to fall before I, even God opened his mouth. The right. Spirit went before him to prepare the way, to set the environment, to perform the spiritual climate change. And we have now relegated in the compound unity of the Godhead. We have edified, glorified, deified as we should Jesus, but the Holy Spirit is now an engagement ring and presented to us in a little box. And we flip open the lid and look at the sparkle and we present it and we put it on the finger and all the selfies from the next days on are looking at it. But then the wedding comes and that comes off, goes back into a box and another band replaces it. Right? And oftentimes that engagement ring is not even brought out anymore, worn anymore, maybe on a special occasion. And the father gives away the bride, and then he's out of the picture completely. So we've taken the father out of the church. He has no role whatsoever. We've taken the Holy Spirit and relegated it to a sparkling jewel in this book, but it's Jesus because we've got 35 minutes to get a message across because people want to get to IHOP before the other church down the street gets there, <laughs> right? so that they don't have to wait in line. And we've robbed our people of the power and the anointing that comes, the strength. And you talk about strength. It's interesting that you started with a passage in your book on strength. And you examined the Greek for strengthened. Yeah, you know, just to, to pivot off for a second on what, what you had said, you know, it, in John chapter 3, Nicodemus asked Jesus probably the greatest question that man could ever, and, and since then has ever asked God. And that was, can, man, can a man be born again? Can a man enter his mother's womb a second time? Right after that, Jesus gave the greatest answer that God could ever, ever give to mankind. And when he said that that which is born <clears throat> of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the spirit is spirit. What spirit? It's the Holy Spirit. So. Jesus was saying, look, you are now born into a lifestyle. You are now, you were born of the Spirit, by the Spirit, through the Spirit. Jesus said, no man comes to the Father except the Spirit draw him. What Spirit? The Holy Spirit. But it doesn't stop there. Um, when, you, when you look at Acts 10.38, when, when the Bible says that how God anointed Jesus with the Holy Ghost and power... And it goes on to say how, you know, he went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Essentially, you can say what validated the manifested power side of his ministry DNA was the present Holy Spirit. Even when you look at what uh, Paul said in Galatians 5, he said, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. What Spirit? The Holy Spirit. Yes. What Paul was saying is that, look, you're now a spiritual people. You've been born in to this spiritual life. The very worst thing that we can do, and, and unfortunately, sadly, we have done it through the generations in, in the body of Christ, is that we let the Holy Spirit, we give him the exit sign as soon as we're born again. In other words, we don't have a spiritual life after salvation. We'll use the Spirit of God to get there, but once we're there, we, we kind of revert back to a place of carnality uh, or a place of compromise. And, and unfortunately, when you have with the absence of the Holy Spirit in the church, man's going to supplement it somehow. And they usually supplement it through, like you said, sensationalism or uh, the, the carnality. Um, but what we've got to remember is that what authenticates this gospel is a manifestation of God's power. When you look about, uh, for example, when, when Jesus, was, in Luke chapter 24, he made a statement to the disciples, which intrigued me even from the early days, because it, it taught me, that was, a, that was one of those trigger moments of where when I read that scripture, I thought, you know what, I need to understand this. I need to understand why Jesus said what he said in Luke 24. Every disciple that was with Jesus was with him for three and a half years, for the most part. You would think that that was the greatest schooling ever for ministry. How could you walk with Jesus, you sup with him, you travel with him, you see close proximity of, of the Son of God moving in such a, a tangible manifested power of God? How could you not 
extract that? How could you not get under that impartation? So every single one of them, when Jesus resurrected, could have went out and started their own ministry right on the day because simply of what they, what they were accustomed to. But Jesus stopped them and he said, no, go back to Jerusalem and pray and tarry until you be endued with power from on high. That word endued actually means to be clothed upon. What Jesus was saying is that, look, you cannot go out and change the world without the Holy Spirit. You cannot go out and validate my gospel without the Holy Spirit. If you want to see the miraculous, if you want to see the supernatural, if you want to see the miracles, if you want to see people healed, saved, delivered, set free, you want to see cities transformed, you've got to partner with the Holy Spirit. That was his mandate given to us. It wasn't say run off to Bible college, print some business cards, put your name on a billboard and smile big. His mandate was tarry until you be endued with the Holy Spirit and power. Now, that was the command that allows us and validates us to go out and move in that same authority and that same power. Sadly, we don't. We stop the Holy Spirit at the cross. You know, we go back to the book of Numbers, Numbers chapter 11. Moses stands before God and says, Lord, this is too much. 600,000 men. This is much too much for one man to handle. If you expect me to do this on my own, right, take my life now. This is more than I can endure. And God says, no problem. Gather together 70 of your elders, and I will take of my spirit which is on you, and I will share it with them. And therefore, the power will go out. So he called together 70 of his elders. And God took of a spirit, which was on Moses, and placed it upon the elders. It happened to be that only 68 showed up. Two were in the camp prophesying. And a messenger comes and tells Joshua about this. And Joshua goes to Moses and says, Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Moses says these words. He said, I wish that all of Israel would be prophets and the Spirit would be available to everyone. Yes, sir. The first time it's ever been mentioned in Scripture that the Spirit would be available to everyone. That occurred in Acts chapter 2. Yep. The Spirit fell and now it became available to everyone for the asking. And it is an exponential increase when one is added to the number one. So when we add a spirit-filled person into our spirit-filled body, it's still one. It's just one to a greater power. Yeah, and the, the compound unity of light. When you look at this whole thing and, and, and you think about how we say, I open my heart to receive Jesus. And then you say, but he's sitting at the right hand of God interceding for me. So I'm opening my heart to receive somebody that's not here. He's there. What am I opening my heart to receive is this deposit of the Holy Spirit that empowers me and that enlightens me, that gives me authority through this paraclete, this advocate, this comforter, this counselor, this, this strength that I can operate, even to the point where... When you stand before the judges of man, don't be concerned about what comes out of your mouth, but let the Spirit. I can surrender completely as you completely surrendered. That night, that night you, the morning you went to preach, and God says, no, go sit down. You surrendered. Yeah. God took over. Okay? I've had the same experience. I, one up to preach a message on be still and know that I am God. And it was um, to go stand at the pulpit, and I had a timer, and I was going to stand there at the pulpit and not say a word for five minutes. Hmm. Now, you know about a pregnant pause and how people start to squirm. After about a minute, okay, a man of my age... Uh, they're thinking, I've stroked out. Right? Uh, after two minutes, they're starting to squirm and get uncomfortable. Under three minutes, there's a little bit of murmuring. You think he forgot. Is he okay? Does somebody, four minutes go by, and there's a stirring, and they're wondering what's going on. And finally, when it hits five minutes, and the little timer starts to blink, 
I begin to quote from the book of Kings. It says, my voice was not in the thunder. It was not in the earthquake. It was not in the storm. It was in the still, small, quiet voice. And you couldn't be still for five minutes to listen for what God was saying to you. Mm -hmm. You and I have seen that happen. And seen the power. But people are resistant to it. They think it's something odd. They, they, this idea that I can be a Pentecostal, charismatic, spirit-filled mm -hmm. Jew is mind-boggling to people that I carry a rabbinic ordination and a Baptist ordination and they're startled by it and I talk about being spirit-filled because that's the only power that I have. I have no power. It says, all power and authority was given unto Jesus. He says, now you will go do even greater than this. Well, how do I wrap my mind about around, around what's greater than what he did? Well, you and I are actually reaching millions of people. And it, he, he reached millions of people. There were three million people in Jerusalem at that Passover. But on a regular basis, through technology, we're now able to expand and to go out and to do things, right? Would that be what he's referring to? We don't know what he meant by that statement because he didn't qualify it. So we are supposed to be about the Father's business, right? hoping that we can use and deploy the strategies. That he, and he gave us strategies. Mm-hmm how to put ourselves in position to receive this anointing. Isaiah 6. What was Isaiah doing chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 that would cause Isaiah in chapter 6? He said, I stood there and I saw the Lord high and lifted up and the hem of his garment filled the temple and the angels saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And he said, I fell to my knees and I said, whoa, I am a man undone. I am a man of unclean lips. And God sent the seraphim with the coal and touched his lips and burned his lips. What had he been doing that caused him five chapters before? What was he doing? Was he prophesying in his own strength and now he comes in the presence of God and gets convicted? That if I'm going to be a messenger of God, then I can't open my mouth until he puts the words in my mouth to speak. Woe, I'm a man undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. It's a powerful picture and a powerful message for you and I. We're talking with Rod Larkins, author of the new book, Overflow, Living Saturated in the Presence and Power of the Spirit. Yeah, this is an intense conversation because the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit is Powerful. It is a two-edged sword to cut to the very marrow, to break the chains that bind you to do what Jesus came to do, was to bind up the brokenhearted and set the captives three, free. And he left after 40 days after the resurrection, and we waited 10 long days for that day of Pentecost to come. The same day that the giving of the law, 50 days after the exodus, was the giving of the Spirit. The same day that 3,000 died, 3,000 were saved. <laughs> 50 days after the resurrection was 50 days after the exodus. God is the God of patterns. God does those kind of amazing things. What died there was raised up and resurrected on the day of Pentecost, on the second Pentecost. You can experience that every day of your life if you put yourself in a position to receive. We're going to take a short break, and we're going to find out from Pastor Rod Larkins, how do you put yourself in a position to receive? What is the right position? Is it prone? Is it standing up? Right. Is it my eyes fixed on the prize? What is it? And what is the benefit to, not to me, and not to you, but to the kingdom of heaven. And why is it so important to God that we must, must resurrect and revive the presence of the Holy Spirit in every single church in the world? We're going to take a short break and we're going to be right back. Not everything that makes the headlines has biblical importance, but 
many events that happen around the world do, and you never hear about them. Igniting a Nation is pleased to teach Revealing Prophecy every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. at the Marriott 280 in Birmingham. We will cover worldwide events and insider information that will connect the dots of what's happening around the world with biblical prophecy. If you happen to miss a class, we'll televise each week's class at 10 o'clock Central Time on ignitinganation.com and all our social media outlets. Copies of the teachings will also be available to purchase on our website at www.ignitinganation.com. The Lord meets you right where you are, and so does Igniting Nation's new live streaming outlets. You can now watch Revealing the Truth, Revealing the Bible, and Prophecy Revealed simulcast live each Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 1 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time on YouTube Live, Facebook Live, Vimeo, Periscope, and through our website www.ignitinganation.com. No matter what device you are using, our program will automatically scale so you won't have to miss a single program. And if you happen to miss an episode, you can always subscribe to the Igniting a Nation YouTube channel and access over 1,000 interviews and never miss your favorite authors, special guests, and topics that interest you the most. There are lots of ways to see Israel. But nothing compares to seeing the land of the book and the people of the book through the eyes of two Jewish believers who can take you on a journey that will bring the entire Bible to life. When you join Rabbi Eric Walker and his number one rated tour guide, Edo Canaan in Israel, you'll experience incredible teachings, first class accommodations, and actually walk where Jesus walked. You will experience the Bible transforming from black and white into living color, and you will never see the Bible in the same way again. For more information, visit us at www.ignitinganation.com forward slash events. The Lord contends with what contends with you, and Igniting a Nation is committed to bringing to light each and every issue that faces a believer's life. Our live stream programming and teachings take you on a journey to finding biblical truth from a wide variety of experts who share their insights into a deeper walk with the Lord. We have assembled the most comprehensive panel of experts in the fields of prophecy, caregiving, healing from trauma, shame and abuse, and so much more. We continue to expand our teachings and programming to meet your needs. We're committed to healing the nations with biblical truth. Visit www.ignitinganation.com to develop a deeper walk with the Lord and start your journey to a transformed life. The Bible commands us to study to show ourselves approved, but most study using Bible study tools and not actually studying the Bible chapter and verse. Igniting a Nation is pleased to present Revealing the Bible, recorded and taught each week before a live audience. We take you deeper into the actual Bible and verse in both Hebrew and English and connect the dots between the Old and New Testament. You can attend our two classes in Tuscaloosa and Birmingham or watch the program every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Central Time on ignitinganation.com and all our other simulcast outlets. For more information, visit www.ignitinganation.com forward slash events. Shalom and welcome back to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker, and we're talking with Pastor Rod Larkins, author of Overflow, Living Saturated in the Presence and Power of the Spirit. That's that dunamis power, that dynamite power of the Holy Spirit. Rod, welcome back to the program. Good to be back. Rod, why have we gotten to this point where we have neutered the Holy Spirit? It no longer fits the gospel message narrative of the homiletics and hermeneutics and exegesis of the Sunday message. It's void. It's gone. It's been removed from the vocabulary. 
And now we've focused on just one part, one third of the council, the heavenly council, the compound unity of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, working in a compound unity that those three together are unbreakable. But you start peeling them off one by one, that's not how the gospel was presented to us. You know, we, I think that uh, for the American church, because I've been in many countries in the world, and you see, you see, and as you, you see different, uh, you see different heartbeats in, in God's people, different, you know, different levels of where they're at, their walk with God. Um, I think that probably the the thing that's hurt us the most in in at least in America is that we become a Laodicean church. Uh, if you look back in in that letter to the Laodicean church, the thing that angered God was that they they made a bold statement saying, "Look, we have everything we need. We don't need you." When you can when you take the sign of God off the door of the church and you're able to function and have a, a successful church service without the presence of God even there, something's terribly wrong. And I think that's the the um, amazing um, it, w- w- boy. When I to see how God feels about his his own, own name being driven from the church. I mean, I I look at it this way: when you can, I, I heard a preacher say one time that a lot of what we classify today as a miracle or as a work of God, any man can take credit for it. And I think that as long as we stay in that lukewarm place, as long as we stay in a place of such prosperity in the natural, where we don't need to hunger for God anymore, we're going to we're going to continually build man's kingdom. And I think that there is a is a a, a a real conflict going on between that kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness right now, because we are great at church and building church people. We're great at building church ministries, but we're lousy at building spiritual people. Um, and I think that that is what's hurting our ability to, you know, you mentioned about uh, transforming cities. When I look at America, how many churches do you know right now in the United States that's troubling their city? You asked me what what would I consider a good measurement? Well, <laughs> let's look after the New Testament model. Let's look what happened in the New Testament, the New Testament church. Those early apostles were brought before the city leaders, and and they made that statement to you. Look, you are troubling our city. The gospel that you're preaching is turning everything upside down. And where are we doing that in America today? Um, you know, I mean, we're we're functioning as uh, an institution with no power, no authority. The cities get more and more wicked. Our society gets more and more wicked, but our churches are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. To me, there's something wrong when, when if we are, if we have a mega mentality, let's not have a mega mentality in order to build a massive institution for ourselves. Let's have a mega mentality to transform an entire city. Um, and I think that the failure in that is be, is contributed back to our Laodicean mentality. When you don't need God, you're not going to hunger for God. Um, and I think that it, it's sad that it takes a national disaster in order to drive people to their knees. You know, you look at the Laodicean, the Laodicean search, and then you look at Revelation chapter 2. And he's talking to the church at Ephesus, and he said, I've seen your great works, but this I hold against you. Look at the height from which you have fallen. You have forsaken your first love, the Holy Spirit. Yes, sir. This was charged, tried, convicted, and sentenced for Mm -hmm. one thing, forsaking the Holy Spirit. The condemnation that the Pharisees received from Jesus when he was casting out a demon was they came to him and said, you cast out this demon in the name of Beelzebub. And he said, you know what, guys, you can say whatever you want about the Son of Man, but you blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. This wicked generation will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. This is the Old Testament life. They were judged under their own law, the law of Moses. What law did they violate? It was the third commandment. Thou shalt not take the Lord's name in vain. In the fullness of the command, it says, or you shall not be found guiltless. 
See, there's a punishment there. We always talk about the blessing of the fifth commandment. Uh, you know, you have a long life, honor your mother and father, so life will be well. We don't talk about this taking the Lord's name in vain, blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Okay? That's saying that the anointing and the ability to cast out demons was the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. You can't be in deliverance. You can't be in healing. You can't be in transformation without having... Uh, it, it's like it, it, a, a doctor tells you to, to take these three medications right, and you're going to be healed. <clears throat> and you take one of the medications and you are chronically ill and your condition gets worse. And you take the whole gamut, the 10 days of that, and you refill that one, but you still don't take the other two. And you just keep getting sicker. And you go back to the doctor for your three-week checkup after that and so uh, why aren't you better? What's going on? We can't figure this out. The, the situation's worse. Yeah, well, I took the one, but I didn't take the other two. Well, no, you had to take them in perfect balance and in perfect harmony because that's how they were designed to work. In perfect harmony. Mm -hmm. And so we look at this and we've, we've, we've drifted, and we've drifted so far away that transformation, healings, Healings. There should be healings going on as just a daily activity. I know, because before I came to faith, I was 70% deaf. My daughter was three years old. I was told that by the time she was six, I would be 100% deaf. And while she was three, that the two of us should go learn American Sign Language together, go to ASL school together, because at three she could learn it and we would be able to talk to each other. I wasn't a believer. So I went and kept getting stronger and more powerful hearing aids. And several years later came to faith and I was in a parking lot. And somebody said, why do you wear hearing aids? And I said, I have this, this degenerative Meniere's syndrome, and it's Meniere's disease, and it's incurable, and so I can get cochlear implants, but I'm not sure what to do. And they said, well, how about if I, you just take those out, and I put my fingers in your ears, and I pray for you? <laughs> and I, I said, you want me to take my hearing aid out, and we're standing in a parking lot, and you want to stick your fingers in my ears, and you want to pray for me? He goes, yeah. I said, okay. I, I don't wear hearing aids. Okay? I have 100% perfect hearing. I never again after that moment of the laying on of hands, of fingers being stuck in my ears, and all the pictures of my daughter as a baby show me with the huge hearing aids in my ears. I have all the pictorial testimony right? and all the hearing exams. I no longer take a hearing exam because I don't have any need for a hearing exam. Okay? That should happen in the parking lot. Mm -hmm. The boldness. Somebody's walking with a limp. Is somebody stopping and saying, excuse me, I don't know you, but you seem to be walking with a limp. You must have something going on. You mind if I pray for you? I don't need to ask questions. I don't need to get a whole story. I, I, it better for me not to know and for it to be revealed to me by my Father in Heaven. Maybe give me a word of knowledge and say, not only is this physical, but, you know, the thing that you've been doing uh, when your wife goes to work, uh, maybe you need to stop that. And they get a word from the Lord. You have to put yourself in the position. So what is that position? Do, is that really available to everybody? It's, it, it certainly is. Um, it, you know, you had asked uh, before the break about, uh, you mentioned about, um, is it possible? What are some of the things that, you know, you know from my experience and what I learned, um, you know, I got to tell you that when I when I begin to really uh, read the Bible after I became uh, born again, I started to see certain scriptures and I started to ask the pastor difficult questions like, all right, so this says this. Why are we not seeing this today? And, you know, there would be there'd be good answers that he would give in some ways. But then I would always bring it back. Well, even you're teaching us how to pray on earth as it is in heaven. Well, where's the heaven reality at? Where's where's this? If, if God gave that to us in the word, I believe that every every word in the Bible is true. So if that's the case, then why are we not seeing it? And if we're not seeing it, what can we do 
in order to really begin seeing it. Because when you look at some of the stories, and that's, I think, the first thing that, that really triggered in my heart is that I thought, God, if you said it in your word, I want to see it today. Nowhere in Scripture does it say that you're going to pour out your spirit and then stop it. Nowhere in Scripture did you did you say, look, I'm your healer today, but there will become a point in, in the future where I'm going to stop healing people. You, you didn't say that anywhere. So I had that assurance from God. It's like, God, I'm going to go on a journey to hunger after everything that the Bible says I can have. Everything that the Bible says I can experience, I want to experience it. And so that put me on a, on a, on a real hunger journey to see those things. One of the first things that God taught me was unity. Now, when you look at the word unity, you know, the scripture in Psalms that we always quote, you know, how good and pleasant it is for man to dwell in unity. Um, we always use that scripture to have um, uh, fellowship parties and fellowship gatherings. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we all need to get along. That's the whole, the whole backbone of that misunderstanding of that scripture. What I learned was is that he wasn't talking about getting along with people. He was talking about getting along with the Holy Spirit. There has to be unity and harmony first with the Holy Spirit. You'll never have a community of people unless you first have a community with the Holy Spirit. So I learned that the hard. I thought, oh, God, I, I need to be in one step with the Spirit of God. I don't want anything that he doesn't want. I don't want to do anything that he doesn't want me to do. Um, and so I began to, to try to position myself in greater unity. You know, the second thing that he really laid on my heart was don't be afraid of the fire. Mm. We know that God, he said himself, part of his identification to mankind was that I am the God who answers by fire. Well, he doesn't just answer to destroy. He also answers to give life. There's not just fire that burns things away. There's fire that anoints, right? Jeremiah said, I have fire shut up in my bones. It was for a reason. So I begin to, to embrace the notion that, look, I need the fire of God in everything, whether it's to purify me, to clean me up, to burn out the dross, or I need the fire to to have a resident, you know, even the priests were warned, do not let the fire go down at the altar. Once the fire goes out, it's over. And so fire is a necessity in seeing heaven's reality, right? But I want to make a statement where uh, that I believe is important because, again, we were, we were talking back and forth about strength. You know, what did the apostles say at the, at the person at the gate? Silver and gold have I none. The commodity that they carried wasn't of this world. It was the anointing and the power of the Spirit of God. When the shadow healed, you remember the story in the gospel where the shadow healed, the greatest commodity in that story wasn't the man, wasn't the people, it was what was contained in the shadow. What was in the shadow? Um, you know, I think I, I mentioned this in the book, you know, there was a, a, a book written uh, years ago called The Dark Sun. And it was by an author, I think his last name was Rhodes, where he was one of the early um, scholars that did a lot of research about the, the bombing in, in World War II of Hiroshima and, and Nagasaki. When they went in and did the research after that nuclear bomb or that atomic bomb had gone off, in the city they would see black silhouettes of figures, of people that when the that bomb detonated, vaporized them. And the the... the heat was so intense that it literally took a snapshot of their silhouette and it formed it onto a concrete wall. So you would see silhouette images of people pulling their carts, people standing there, and it just burned that image into a, an object. Well, the interesting thing is the same way about heaven. That shadow that healed that person was a photographic impression of what life is like in heaven. That's all it was wasn't that the shadow was some great shadow, it's just that it contained a reality of heaven. And if we, if we were given the model to pray on earth as it is in heaven, you would think that it would, be, it would do us good as God's people to really start putting a demand on our faith, to start seeing heaven's reality on earth. It was in the model prayer that Jesus taught, as you pray, pray this. In other words, let my reality look, the reason why people were healed is because it's a reality of heaven. There's no need to lay hands on people in heaven because there's no sickness. Right. There's no sickness because it's not sanctioned. We allow it here in the earth. It's not because we have to, it's just because we do. We willingly lay down that authority and power to heal the sick. Uh, but I believe that as we are 
turning more and more towards the New Testament principle and the Old Testament principle, because it's all throughout Scripture that he is our healer. He is our Jehovah Rapha. Um, as we press on that demand of faith, God will give us the, 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 the direction and the ingredients to see miraculous healings more and more. And I believe that those are just some, of, some things that came to mind about what really set me on that course. But I can tell you this, the moment that my faith began putting a demand on those truths, that's when I really started to see miracle healings. I mean, tumors disappearing, people getting creative miracles during praise and worship service without anybody even laying hands on them, um, where just the presence of God would consume the atmosphere. When the glory is president, there is no sickness. When the glory has precedence over an atmosphere, there is no demonic manifestation and demonic, it all goes away because it is in that realm uh, of God's uh, goodness and God's glory. You know, this idea of a consuming fire, <laughs> and we take a look at the burning bush, and mm -hmm. we see that uh, this Eish Elohim, the fire of God, which is something that we desire, not to be afraid of the fire of God, but to be drawn to it as mm -hmm. a sign for us, as a reminder. A pillar of fire by night for 40 years as a reminder to the children of Israel of God's presence, of his authority to deliver him, to deliver them, and deliver on the promises that he made to them that they would live in houses they did not build and eat from vines and from fields they did not plant. And this was the promise for the new nation of Israel that he was birthing. And he used fire as a constant reminder to them. And he said, don't bring strange fire. And so we're seeing in some places strange fire and we're seeing this sensational and people are drawn to the sensational, but there's a big difference between the supernatural, which is the Word of God, is the most supernatural thing that's ever been given to mankind, is the Word straight from heaven. That's when we have that reverent awe, that reverent fear. People, James says, if anybody lacks wisdom, ask for it. Then you've got to go back to where it comes from. Solomon says... Fear of the Lord is beginning of wisdom. Right. Absolutely. Go back to the starting point. Go back. You know, do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Go back to the starting point and maintain <clears throat> the right attitude and the posture. And then you'll find that heaven, you know, open heaven, heaven's always been open. Always. Always been open. God never shut heaven down. Pastor Rod, we have run out of time, but uh, my friend, we could talk for hours about the power and the overflow, and he gives it to you. He says, my cup overflows. This is a promise, and this is a description of him is, is pouring out his spirit. He said, and in those days, I will pour out my spirit on all mankind. We are in those days. And if we don't recognize it and claim that these are the days, the days of Elijah, the days of the prophet Joel, and allow for God to perfect what he said and for us to believe it and step out in faith and apply it, then we are going to die on the vine. And he wants to bring life. And he wants to bring life and life more abundantly through the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Overflow. He wants your life to overflow. Rod Larkins, author of the new book, Overflow, Living Saturated in the Presence and Power of the Spirit. Go visit IgnitingAnation.com. Click on today's show schedule. Click on today, the name Rod Larkins. It's going to take you right <laughs> to the book. You just press one button there. takes you right to the book. Order it, get it, and apply it. This is one of those where faith without works is dead. If you don't apply these principles, you're not going to see the overflow. Pastor Rod Larkins, thank you, my friend, for being with us for this hour. My pleasure. Thank you so much. You're welcome. God bless. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we'll bring in the next edition of Revealing the Truth. <laughs> 